thing start? Did it look like it started? I think it started. Right. Did I see a hand up in the back? Yeah. Uh, for the website, uh, it says something about I need a key or something like that from you. Just to do what it says. I need the rope because I have my access code that's fine that and all good. Did you link? Did you link from the Blackboard link? Did you link? Um, so in order to get to the right spot, I think you maybe went to the website where MindTap is. In our Blackboard shell, when you click the link on the side that says MindTap and you click it through Blackboard, it brings you to the interface that links you to our course. So everybody, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Everybody go to link to MindTap through Blackboard. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else? Did anybody get in successfully? Oh, good. All right, so we have some, some people got in. Good. So your first homework is due Thursday night, Thursday night, midnight with that. So all of you, uh, make sure you get over to the bookstore or log into the system and get in. Um, the first homework is just getting to know MindTap. So I kind of made... There's some easy exercises of learning the system. So part of that will be like digitally drawing a demand and supply curve and there's some other like tools that you're gonna need to use. And then there's a little bit of a math quiz. So it's important, uh, we, do, we don't do a lot of math, but we do some basics in here. And so um, you wanna make sure that you uh, hit that and kind of brush, dust the cobwebs out for that. Okay, anything else? All right. So, um, so we left off yesterday talking about Adam Smith and the butcher, the brewer, and the baker. So um, those of you who weren't here, hopefully, did I, I can't remember, did I send out the recording? I don't think I did. Did you guys get a rec yes, uh, Monday's recording? I don't think I did. So normally I'll try to send out the recording. If you do miss a class, uh, you missed the attendance, of course, and you missed uh, the part of that, but you can review things there. So those of you who came up and got the syllabus, we took a lot of time talking about getting started with the course and all of that. So uh, make sure you check that out. I'll, I'll try to get that out today. All right, so it is not the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker from which we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Um, what was benevolence again? Being kind, being nice, so it's not the benevolence, but rather your self-interest. Now, the first thing I want to hit is what is self-interest, right? So if you are selfish, who do you care about? You and only you, really, right? So selfishness is all about you, but we know that you've got you know, some family and friends. You've got people in your city, maybe, in your community. Uh, you've got people in your state, people in your country, or in the USA anyway, I know not all of you are American, and then you've got the world. And so when Adam Smith talks about self-interest, he's not talking about selfishness. He makes that very clear in his early, in his early work, that we're thinking about you and the things you care about, which is likely you and your friends and family, maybe you've got a little bit of overlap here into the city, you don't care about too much people in the city, but you don't have a lot of affinity for necessarily your state, you might have a little concern. But the point is, is that the further out you go, the less concern you have for other people, right? And so the butcher, the brewer, and the baker, being self-interested, caring mostly about maybe their friends and their family, uh, want to give you uh, some food uh, as long as you pay for it and engage in trade. So what keeps the butcher, let's say, let's suppose, suppose the butcher um, has the price of steak of uh, $10, right? So $10 per pound. And the butcher being, let's say, really greedy, he's really more on the the selfish side, right? So here's the butcher. Uh, he's really greedy, nasty. And he says, I'm gonna charge, what am I charging 10 for? I'm gonna charge 20. Screw this. Let's go 20. Is that a good move for him? 
he's the you know he's the only butcher shop in town he's the butcher I mean you could charge whatever price you want what would be is there any consequences that you'd predict might happen if he raises his prices to 20 less customers okay so one thing we're gonna get into early here this week is the law of demand and so if you increase price that'll lead to fewer customers but if I double price and I only lose uh, which is about a hundred percent increase right hundred percent increase in price and I lose ten percent of my customers is that a good move financially that's still a good move right and that's something called the elasticity of demand that we'll talk about later so hundred percent increase and let's say the you know this ends up being maybe a loss of just uh, ten percent then that would still be financially a good move so why don't all of them raise prices and just become the richest people in town the butcher the brewer and the baker balance of what though balance of i would say okay i would say power but just balance of like of price right so you gotta have like if you have three people right uh that have all different prices right one has a higher price one has a lower price one has like a price in the middle you may never know customers might have that have a lot of money or go to the one to okay so they might have other options right they yeah. might have other options and so we didn't really talk about other options but that's what keeps this greed in check that's one of the most important ingredients in a healthy capitalist market-based system is to have lots of competition and so the baker is thinking oh well, I know how to bake cakes this guy's just beating meat over here I can do that I've got extra store space in my uh, bakery. I'm gonna start selling meat, and I'm gonna offer it for $18, says the baker. What does the butcher have to do? Assuming, assuming this is a good substitute, has to lower it, maybe to get to 17. The baker says, oh, I got plenty of room to go there, let's go 16, right? Now we're back to 12. Now I can do 12. Where does the pricing competition end? How low does it go? Does it go to zero? No. No. Because what do we gotta do? Go ahead. What's your name again? Sterling. Sterling. What? Uh, how low? You raised your hand. Uh, would we go to zero, or how low do you think we'd go? I thought I saw you raise your hand. Till you start losing money. Till what? Till you start losing money. Still, you start losing money. Yeah. So they can only go down far enough to where they don't want to go to work anymore. It's not worth it for them. Now for the baker, would that include some profit? Do these guys need to be earning some profit? Yeah, so we're gonna be pushing it down to what we call a normal profit through competition, right? Because eventually the price would get so low and maybe they're only making a buck per pound and they're like, ah, I can bake cakes and make two bucks a pound or you know, two bucks for my time. Uh, it's not worth it anymore. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sell meat anymore, right? And so competitive forces keep the price fair in a market system. It ends up being a fair price because competition keeps that greed in check if they're trying to charge too high of a price. So healthy competition is one of our most important ingredients in a in a healthy market system that has efficient prices that are fair, fair for the buyer fair for the seller and it's the invisible hand Adam Smith says the invisible hand of the market will find the right price so one of Adam Smith's famous things here is the invisible hand so the invisible hand of the market will guide price prices to the most efficient and I would argue fair we'll put that in quotes fair price when competition is present when competition is present. I'll try not to write in green. I usually don't. I usually have the accent color. It doesn't come off quite as good. 
Why did he use the word invisible hand? Well, what was the year again Adam Smith wrote this piece? 1776, good. So 1776 was coming on the heels of lots of places being uh, guided by kings and queens, right? And uh, leaders that said, you do this. Oh, the price of meat is too high. I need you to uh, only charge $15 per pound, right? It was the leaders, the king and the queen's hands that were guiding those sorts of things because the king and the queen owned everything. Now with distributed ownership of private property rights, it's these competitive forces and the interactions. We don't have anybody setting any one price, but they get nudged by following their own self-interest to change prices to the most efficient and effective one. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, I'm gonna switch over to a little bit of PowerPoint. Hopefully that thing didn't time out. Dang. seen Castaway. Old movie, Tom Hanks is the, is the main character. Uh, it's a great movie. Um, he makes a friend with, of a volleyball and um, it's a good Hollywood production film. And so um, my question is, is if you are on an island, so here's the, our island, and you're all by yourself, uh, is that an economy? Let's suppose that, you know, you need to go out like the movie showed and and uh, do some fishing and some coconut harvesting, right? Is that an economy? What are some of the essential elements of an economy? What do you think are some essential elements of an economy? Give me your name. Jensen. Je Jensen? Yeah. Making money. Making money. Okay, so do we need to be making money? What else? Let's hear some uh, fire, rapid fire here. An economy. What goes on in a, an economy that makes it an economy? Uh, some money in there, making some money. Say exchange, of goods. exchange of goods, good. So some trade. Resources. resources, right? So we got resources to do this. We have the land and the water, or whatever. So we got that going on. So yeah. Demands. Demand. Okay. So the demand to want to get something to consume. So we have consumption, and uh, we're using the land to produce stuff, right? So we have production and consumption and exchange and money, and those are some of the elements that we have. And so the question is, if you are by yourself, is this an economy? Would you say that a one-person island is an economy? Is there production? Yeah, he producing coconuts or fish. Is there consumption? Yeah, okay, and I saw a hand up. Did you want to comment? Well, I was just gonna say. And give me your name again. Uh, Rayleigh. Rayleigh. Yeah, he's the only one, so we don't have, somebody mentioned exchange, right? We don't have that part going on. Although, is there a trade-off? I think there's a trade-off going on here. What sort of trade-offs are going on in the island, even though there's not another person? How, in a sense, is Tom trading with himself to some degree? Jensen? Survival. Survival? Um, yeah, but I want to think about the production, right? I mean, I don't know what the trade-off is, but what do you mean survival? Like, eating versus not eating or something, or...? Okay. Yeah, way back. How much time? Yeah, so if he's out fishing, can he be out coconut harvesting? No. So there is kind of a trade off there, right? An internal trade off of him kind of trading with himself because he only has a certain amount of hours in a day and can't be doing both things at one time. So I tend to agree with you. I think that we need to have some more people out there. Um, so one of the questions that Adam Smith addressed 
In his prior book, in 1756, he wrote the book, uh, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I told you he was actually kind of a philosopher. And then a nature, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations was his second book in 1776. And so he really did care about the interactions of people and kind of what makes us human and how do we know ourselves. Long story short, you don't really know yourself until you've done something and seen the reaction of somebody else. Right? Imagine if you grew up as a, as a baby going uh, and you never had any interactions. How well would you know yourself right? until you've offended somebody else? And they say, don't do that. Right? So that's part of the stuff that he tackled. And all of that he set as the grounds for this exchange economy where we would be doing things um, and trading. So each person's got these trade-offs. Let's suppose that Tom has the ability to do eight coconuts and eight fish, or uh, he could choose to do four coconuts and 12 fish. And then Jen, luckily, this is not part of the movie, by the way, Jen uh, washed up on the island, and um, she can do some production as well. Now again, I don't think it's an economy if, if Tom lives in California and Jen lives in Florida and they never see each other, just because there's two people doesn't mean it's an economy. I think you've got a society, but I think so, whoever said exchange back there, uh, having some element of trade is what makes it an economy. That's one of our essential elements. So Jen, on a given day, can do four coconuts and eight fish, or three coconuts and 11 fish. So by looking at this data on their abilities and their productions, what can you tell me? What inferences can you make off that information? Yeah, let me go here. Uh, give me your name. Jordan. 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 Okay, so Tom over here is more productive, right? He can make more stuff than Jen. So like with A, eight fish and eight coconuts, Jen does eight and four. Um, 12 and four, 11 and three. So Tom has what we call an absolute advantage in production. So Tom's one of those guys that can sing, he can dance, he's a superstar football player, right? Uh, mostly A's in college, like he does everything. He's smart, right? He can do all that stuff. And so why would he ever want to trade with Jen? So what I've done here is I've kind of stacked the deck. And this is actually based on a true story of what David Ricardo did in the early 1800s. Uh, Ricardo was a Frenchman and he went to the King of England because he wanted to engage in trade and trade some wine for chicken is the way he, the two goods that they lined up. And he said, oh, King of England, I know you're better at everything, but let me show you why you should trade with us Frenchmen. And that's what we've set the deck here. We're gonna take this and see if Jen can maybe persuade Tom to do some trade, even though he's the hot shot at everything. Is anybody seeing some possibilities right now with that stuff, Brixen? Jen, yeah, Jenny, Jen, yeah. I had JLo on my mind when I did it originally, so. <laughs> so when it comes to the exchange, since Tom can produce more coconuts than Jen can, but she can produce just about the same amount of fish if she focuses solely on fish. Okay. It would be it would be better for Tom to trade her coconuts and for Jen to trade her fish. Are you seeing some cost? Like, what's the cost of them? Are you seeing some cost differences in terms of that, that internal trade-off that I talked about earlier of I can go out and do fishing. If I do that, I can't go do coconuts. Think about that trade-off for those two. Jay? Uh, if they combine resources, like if they combine their, his power and her, because really think about it, it's all about like, you can combine it, even though they might have different resources, they still combine to get it better. But they well, we want to prove that, though, with the numbers. So mm -hmm. not just kind of have a hunch, but that's what economists do is we quantify things. So I want, we, we're going to kind of prove this mathematically. I'm just kind of curious if anybody's 
seeing some trade-offs there. Yeah, uh, give me your name again. It's Justice. Justice. Well, since the coconuts on her side, maybe they don't grow as much, or she doesn't have like the same. We're gonna have equal growth, like they're living actually in the same, when I said Florida, California, they're actually living in the same little island. So they have equal access to those stuff, to both uh, the trees and the water. Okay, let's move on. Well, let's just investigate that. <clears throat> so here's what I want to do. Put on some graphing goggles, for starters, and say, this is Tom's A and B, right? So these are, if we plot the points, Tom could have the <coughs> 12, uh, 12 and 4. Oops, I did that backwards here. What am I doing here? Uh, 8 and 8. So 8 and 8 or 4 and 12. And so now what's that trade-off? Well, it's a one-for-one one trade-off for Tom, right? Everybody with me there? If he gives up four coconuts, he can get four fish, but it's a one-to-one one trade-off. So if we boil it down to per unit, which we're gonna do a lot in this class, it's a one fish costs one coconut, or you can think of it as one coconut costs one fish. It's a one-for-one one trade-off. Well, what's going on with Jen? If we plot her points here, one coconut equals three fish, right? So if she gives up a coconut and goes fishing, one fish is going to cost a third of a coconut with her trade-off. So everybody with me there? All we're doing is we're looking at, the, those were the two production points that we did earlier, and that's now the trade-off. So who's the better fisher? in this sense. Who's doing fishing at the least cost? Me, Jen. It's Jen. Yeah, what's your name? Kayla. Kayla? Kayla. Kaylin. So it's Jen who's doing the fishing at a lower cost. If she goes out, she's only giving up a third of a coconut. Tom, it's one. Questions on that? <clears throat> All right, so what should we do? Now we're gonna get into the specialization thing. So if Tom pushes himself in all coconuts, one for one basis, he could do 16. And if Jen pushes herself to doing all uh, fish, she could do 20, right? So now we have the world supply of coconuts and fish being 16 and 20. And then what are they gonna need to do? Trade. Trade, right. So let's try to see <clears throat> how we've transformed the world in a sense. The two kinked lines that I've drawn now represent the world's possi uh, production possibilities frontier. So in other words, the world's production is this. <clears throat> So notice if they all, if they both go fishing, Jen does 20, Tom does 16, the world, their little island of two people, can have 36 fish, right? And now, if we're going to go and try to get some coconut milk now, because we're getting thirsty to wash down our fish, who do we send out for coconuts, Tom or Jen? Tom. And that's why this part here is an orange line because we're going to be sending out Tom because Tom gives up the least amount of fish when he goes and goes coconut harvesting. <clears throat> so now we can start trucking along this line. So what we really did is this line is his. Once we get to this point where we have 16 coconuts, we still might want more coconuts, but who has to go do them now? Jen because Tom's maxed out, right? Tom's maxed out at 16, so as we move this way along here, if we want to have more coconuts, we can do it, but it's gotta be Jen who goes out. And so that's why this part is really Jen's trade-offs. So now we're thinking about the world a little bit differently, right? And we're using our resources most efficiently according to comparative advantage. So Jen has a comparative advantage in fishing. Tom has a comparative advantage in coconuts. And that sets the stage for them to be able to uh, do some trading through specialization and trade. 
All right, questions or comments on that part? <clears throat> Got one more thing to point out. XA and XB, what I did with there is I just said, suppose they both do their A's, right? Remember the, the, the slide a couple times ago, the A production levels and the B production levels. Their combined production is here and here. What can you tell me about XA, them both doing a little bit of coconuts and fish versus XC? What's the difference? What is going on at XA where they're both doing a little bit of fish and coconuts? There's less uh, resources. Uh, actually, it's not resources. So there's not less resources because we still have the sun and the water and the island and the ground. So resources haven't changed with XA. It's just that we are on... Let me just go back to make sure we're clear here. All I've done is do 4 plus 8 is 12, and 8 plus 8 is 16. That is what this is. So the island is still the island. Jen has her time. Tom has her time. So the resource base is the same. Give me your name. Tyler. Tyler. So what's going on at XA? What would we call XA, the point XA compared to XC, or it was one way to think about it, although you don't have to answer that. Brixton, I saw your hand go up. They're producing less overall. They're producing less overall. The world is producing less overall. And so this really shows the gains that we can get by using our resources more efficiently. So all the, you're, you were kind of touching on the right thing there. The resources are being used correctly, uh, or being used perhaps, but not in the most efficient, effective way. We're not utilizing, you can almost think of this as like technology, like knowledge of Jen's production uh, being less costly in coke and fish than Tom's. And so we say that this is an inefficient point of production. It's inefficient in the sense that there's some free fish and coconuts to get. Using the same resource base, we can reorganize production putting Jen on fishing and Tom on coconuts and get to XC. That's free coconuts and fish, right? That's pretty cool. That's more efficient. So this is an inefficient point. A point like XC or any other point, by the way, over here, are all points that are productively efficient. They are efficient points. Because we could do the same thing here. Even XB, we could be here with more of both or just more fish or just more coconuts, right? All of those points along here would be more efficient than XB. Okay, so what happens next? Tom's got all the coconuts. Jen's got all the fish. They get together. Tom says, how about two fish per coconut? Being the self-interested person he is. Is that a raw deal for Jen? Is that a raw deal? Should Jen turn down that offer? Tom is not the dictator leader of the, of the island. Everything's voluntary here. Nobody has to do anything they don't want to. Tom owns his coconuts. Jen owns her fish. Is that a raw deal? Should Jen be saying, screw you? So put yourself in Jen's mind for a moment. She's got 20 fish here. If she wants some coconuts, she'd have to go out and do it herself. And what would she have to pay to get one coconut if she did it herself? How many? Three, right? So if Jen wants a coconut, she can do it, but her internal trade-off kicks in and she'd have to give up three fish. So is two fish a deal? Yeah, yeah. right? So now she gives up a fish and she gets uh, she, uh, two fish for every coconut. Now, if Jen's getting a deal, then Tom is an idiot, right? Tom screwed up, he must be the one who's getting screwed. She wins, he loses, 
Correct? No. No. Why no? Yeah, because he has got kind of a good thing going here. If he was to do it himself, it would have been a one for one. So he gives up a coconut and he only gets one fish. Now he's going to get two fish. What? A win-win situation? Both parties gain? Capitalism and markets isn't somebody's a winner and somebody's a loser? Walmart wins and you lose when you go give your hard-earned money to Walmart to buy some stuff? Isn't that the way the world works? That it's all the big corporations winning and us poor people are just losers? No. Let's, let's pick on Walmart for a sec. Um, let's see. Let me go back here. Um, Oh, you got it. Yeah, maybe I should use yours. I'm gonna, I, I saw yours here, but yours looks nice too. What is that? Ooh, okay, okay. So, did you have to buy the warrant? Not that one. Okay. Well, we can pretend, yes. Um, what's your name? Emily. So, Emily, uh, what was the price of that thing? At, what do those go for at Walmart? Roughly. We don't have to be perfect. It's not about something. How much? $40. $40? Is it really? Is it less? Super, oh my gosh, okay, maybe this is a bad example. Um, <laughs> so $40, so let's go with $40. So it's the hydro, you said the hydro what? Plastic. Okay, and what does it keep? Stuff cold for like 46 days or something? Or yeah. Roughly, okay. All right, <clears throat> so um, Walmart has a, uh, a price of 40 for those uh, water jugs. What's the value of it to Emily? So let, I know you might, this might be a bad example. I'm kind of going down maybe a bad path because uh, you, maybe you got it as a gift or something from your parents, but that's okay. So what do we know that Emily, assuming she bought it, so we'll just kind of make up a little story here. What is the value of it to Emily? And I want Emily to answer. What is the value of that to you? We, we know that, you, that the price was 40. What, what's the value of it to you? Nice and loud? I use it every day. You use it every day. Uh, I want you to give me a dollar value, actually. So translate, you know how, how nice it's been now that you've had it. Keep stuff warm, keep stuff cold. You've used it a while. Uh, maybe you did your research ahead of time before you bought it. Uh, and you knew that this would be great as an athlete, uh, that you're gonna be able to stay hydrated and stuff will stay cold, so you'll be more incentive to drink water like coach wants you to, all that jazz, right? So, what is the dollar value of it to you? $40. Okay, does everybody value it at $40 that buys those? What do some people value it at? All we know is that Walmart sells, you know, 10 of those a day. So over the course of a month, Walmart sold 300 of those things. Did everybody value it at $40? What was their personal value? I saw some heads shaking. What, 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 which way were you shaking? Did they value it at less than $40? So they went into Walmart bought something that they got $20 worth of value for and they purchased a $40 item? Is that what we do? No. How many of you have gotten a deal when you've gone to Walmart to buy anything now? We can get off water bottles. How many people have felt like they got a deal, even at Walmart? You walked into Walmart and you're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel good about that. I got a deal. Big show of hands. I kind of hope, how many people have gotten a deal on anything in their life? Raise your hand. And hope everybody raises their hand, right? Everybody's gotten a deal on something. Well, that deal is because you valued it at something higher than the price you paid. So your personal value of it is something higher than the price or equal to the price. So it is possible that you valued it at 40, but another way to look at it is, um, would you have paid 43? Knowing how good the thing is, maybe you saw your friends had it. You know, would you pay 45? Maybe. Would somebody pay 50? Maybe. Would somebody pay 55? Maybe. Would somebody pay $100 for it? Probably not. We're probably stretching it, but um, 
If you were, uh, maybe you've been put in this position, if you were going on a, a big hike for 15 days and you're like, oh crap, I forgot my water bottle. And you go to the little convenience store at the bottom of the mountain and the nearest Walmart or any other store is 100 miles away and you're about to start your 15 day hike. Would you pay $100 for the water bottle to take water on your trip? You probably need it, you better, right? Now all of a sudden my value has changed, that it is worth $100 depending on the circumstances. So the point with all that is that we, we value stuff differently. We all have different values. And so the market price then shows the minimum value you place on it. So when we look at the price of the, that, of the stuff that we buy anywhere, the purchases that we make, all we know is that that is the minimum value that you place on it. And you likely have more. Okay, so back to our, our uh, story here. <clears throat> um, there's a whole uh, range of prices that would work, right? Would, would 2.1 fish work? Yeah. Would 2.1, yeah. Would 1.9 fish work? Yeah, so there's a whole range here. So with these green bars kind of highlight that. Um, Jen is willing to pay up to three fish, but once we get to three fish, she's like, oh, I can just do it myself if it's gonna be higher than three. And Tom is like, uh, I need at least one fish because otherwise I can do it myself. So anything other than 1.1 would be, make him better off, right? So now we have a price range and a market is born. Somewhere between three and one is going to be a price that creates a winner and a winner in this market exchange. All right, so we've got two winners. And this graph now shows the consumption possibilities for each person. And the first thing to note is that all of the consumption possibilities are outside what you could do for yourself. So even though, remember, Tom was the hot shot, can sing, dance, uh, smart, athletics, everything, Tom still has incentive to exchange with Jen. Jen has something to offer. This is actually very powerful for international trade. The poorest of the poor countries in Africa or down in South America have something to offer the big rich United States. Every country has a comparative advantage in something, right? There's gonna be ways to make both parties better off. Both parties, America's not gonna to have to just give international aid to those countries. They can engage in trade and both countries can be made better off. That's what this really highlights. That's what Ricardo was trying to show the King of England. And this is why we trade internally. This is why Kansas trades with Missouri. This is why Russ trades with Ottawa University, right? All of this is win-win situation. Okay, so check it out. Let's start with Tom here. If Tom was to do coconuts on himself by himself, down one over one. But now with Jen, down one over one, two, boom. And I could be anywhere along this green line. All of my, before when I was by myself, what I produce is what I consume, right? So if I was at point A, that's what I ate. But now I could be at point D. Same thing for Jen. She used to give up one, two, three fish to get one coconut. Now she gives up one, two, one, and she is enjoying consumption beyond what she could ever do by herself. Truly two winners from engaging in trade. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so how many of you watch Shark Tank? You watch Shark Tank, kind of a fun show. You know, what does Kevin uh, usually ask when the small business is asking for money? You know, how does this thing scale up? What happens if you get hit by a bus? How, do, how, do, how does this business scale up? And so this is how Tom and Jen scaled up. So it scales up pretty nicely. So Tom and Jen got busy and we have over 300 million people now on the island. And these, this is the island dwellers. There's little guys here and old people and uh, people who are working, people who are not working. So it turns out in the United States, about half of the people are in the labor force, half of them are employed. So that's the blue people, which means that during the course of the day, the 24 hours a day, 
They might spend roughly eight hours over here working for a company to where they are using their comparative advantage. You guys are trying to develop a comparative advantage by being at Auto University and getting that degree. Whatever your areas of specialty are, you're gonna try to go find a niche over here where you do pretty well and you enjoy your job, right? That's a comparative advantage. So together, that business creates something, a product, and then it's sold back to these guys. These guys, of course, get a paycheck and they come back and uh, try to live their life pursuing their self-interest. Do these guys have to know all of the consumers that buy their product? No, that's another kind of marvelous thing of the marketplace is that by you looking out for yourself, your self-interest, you end up serving people in other countries even, right? As this group of individuals pursue their own self-interest, they don't give a darn about somebody over in uh, Japan. They just don't know them. They might like them if they got to meet them, but they don't have to meet them, right? And that they're creating a winner over in Japan. The win-win situation goes on day in and day out all the time. So this thing scales up wonderfully, the use of comparative advantage and specialization. Okay, any other comments or questions there? I just get like tingles going on this. This is just, this is, this is awesome stuff. So this is the production possibilities frontier. This will be hit uh, more in like chapter two is kind of where you'll see uh, this stuff coming into play. Okay. <clears throat> So let's look at the marketplace and one other picture here before we get away. We're not going to spend too much time on the PowerPoint, but I'll do a little bit here. By the way, you'll have access to these, these slides. Okay, so this is what we talked about yesterday. Um, there's a resource base on our island, and we can categorize those resources into those four basic categories. What's this one? Land, Land. Labor. Labor. labor, capital, man-made stuff that helps make other stuff, and entrepreneurship. All right, so those resources are owned by people in varying capacities, and so that's the economic problem. How do we make, how do we have people try to serve their self-interest and make themselves off uh, as best off as they can um, through using their talents and their comparative advantage. So one thing I want to step back from is think about how does the world change for us, right? How do we get more resources? Well, this calls into question kind of two fundamental things of stock variables and flow variables. And so I like to think of there being a bucket of computers right now, right? So the capital stock is a level of this bucket. If we were to take an inventory of all the resources that we have in the United States, it would be some amount right now. And then how does it change as we do stuff over time to fill up the bucket? We might be buying more computers through what we call investment. So investment is a variable. The capital, the number of machines is a variable. Right? So we're going to talk about a lot of different types of variables. These are all variables. It just means something that can take on different values, right? something that can change in the amount. And so we're going to buy some machines this year. So if we started with 100 and we purchased 50, the, the water level would go up to 150. But there's also a hole in our bucket. So depreciation, some of the computers have worn out or they don't function the way they were supposed to. And so some of that flows out, maybe 25. So we purchased 50, we threw away 25, and so the bucket level ends up being 125 next year at the, next time, at the start of the next time period. All right, so that's stocks and flows. Let me give you another example. Um, suppose I told you I make 175,000. Living here in Ottawa, Kansas, that's my income, so the variable's income, 175,000. Would you say I'm doing okay, rich, not poor at least, more than okay, especially in Ottawa, Kansas, 175 grand a year, uh, not, not too bad, probably you know, rich, if, if it was per year, 
But when I first said it, I kind of screwed up my, my little thing I'm trying to point I'm trying to prove here when I said per year. I didn't say per year when I, when I said it the first time. It was over the last 10 years. I made 175 grand over the last 10 years. So now I went from rich to poverty in the blink of an eye, right? Because that would be 17.5 per year, which is below the poverty level for a married couple. So what if I told you I make 175 grand per month? Now we're in the astrophere of uh, you know LeBron James or something and other other. Uh, well, that's not even his level, um, but uh, you're doing pretty darn good if you're making over a million a year, right, in income. So the point with all that is that the variable income has no meaning if there's not a time frame associated with it. 175,000 per year, per 10 years, per month changes the value of that variable. You with me? All right, so it has to have a time frame. When I said 175 grand initially, you guys correctly kind of internalized like, oh, everybody always talks about it annually, so he must mean it's annual income. But I didn't say that. So in order for income to have meaning, it is a flow variable and it has to have a time frame associated with it. Now, on the flip side, if I said that I have 175 grand in my checking account and I'm gonna take the class out tonight to downtown Kansas City, and we're not coming back until it's all gone. Are we gonna have a good time? Yeah, I, it'd be, it'd be kind of hard to even spend that kind of money, right? We'd be buying cars or something and uh, whatever else. But we, you know, we, I'd, I'd love to take on that challenge. I don't have that kind of money sitting in my checking account anyway. So uh, we won't be doing that little exercise, but it's fun to think about. So checking account balance is another variable. That variable has meaning at a point in time. Like right now, my checking account balance, when I said we'd go out and have a fun time tonight, that had meaning right away because we know that it has value at a point in time. And now we kind of see the stock and flow. As I get a paycheck coming in, that paycheck causes my checking account balance with the direct deposit to go up. And then what do I do with it? I go out and spend some money. And then the checking account balance goes down. So the income and the inflow and the outflow are the flow variables and the stock variable is the checking account balance. Okay, questions or comments there? So the same is true then with the number of machines, the amount of labor, uh, what can cause the labor bucket to go up? What causes the labor bucket to go up over time? I'll give you a hint. More people make babies, yes. So if we make babies, then by the time they're 16, they are potentially eligible to be working legally in the United States. Now, if they're on a farm, they might be working at age 12 or even earlier, but uh, we can have population growth, right? So population growth is a flow variable. We make babies, people die, right? So it changes the bucket of labor or the population. So we can do this with all kinds of variables. It's an important concept to kind of keep in mind as we move through a lot of things. All right, so how do we produce things? We use those basic resources to make the stuff we want. We got pizza, t-shirts, uh, basketballs, beer, chicken wings. Um, all the stuff that we want is done through a production process. And every economy must answer those three basic questions. What are we gonna make? How are we gonna do it? Who's going to get it? And so back in the era of the kings and queens, the kings and queens owned all of this stuff and they decided, well, what do I want? How do I want it done? And who's going to get it? I'm gonna get it and I'll give out some to some, some others that are good workers maybe or something, right? So they uh, did all that. In a market system, it's a little bit different. <clears throat> We have dispersed property rights and can think about that production process in a little bit different way. So what determines what's going to be made in the United States? I mean, how do we get all that crap on the shelves at Walmart? Does Walmart determine what is going to be put out? 
or what, do, what drives Walmart's decision on what they should put on the shelves? Brixton? Uh, demand and necessity. Okay, so demand meaning the consumers, right? right. The buyers. Is Walmart gonna put something on the shelf that's not gonna sell? No. Is that their goal? No, They're, what's, what is their goal? To make money. To make money. So they are self-interested, right? And they're, we're gonna talk about profit maximization later in the course and learn how they maximize profits. So their goal is to make money. And so who are, are they trying to serve? The consumer. They want to put stuff on the shelves that is going to sell. If they make a mistake, do they have to sell it at a loss? Do they have to, if they, they, if they overshot that water bottle and they, they, pay, they bought those water bottles for 30 bucks and they put them on the shelves and in little old Ottawa, uh, people can't afford water bottles like that. Do they maybe have to have a sale and sell it for 20? Yeah, right? So they pay the price for not serving properly the customer, right? they have to pay the price then by doing it and incur a loss on that product. So the what is actually the consumer. There's a saying of consumer sovereignty in uh, the market system. The consumer is king. Con the consumer is king. What the consumer wants is what the consumer gets because the producers are just looking to make money and they will offer up to you whatever they can turn a buck on. Right? So the consumer decides the what question. How about the how question? There's lots of different ways to make products. We can go um, to an engineer and learn different ways. When I was your guys' age, I went on spring break to Mazatlan. And I was looking across the street, eating breakfast, and I saw three guys, three Mexicans, with three sickles. Do you guys know what a sickle is? It's like the Grim Reaper, the... The little hatchet type thing. And three guys with three sickles, and they were doing this at a hotel, by the way, at a hotel across the street where I was eating, they were doing this. What were they doing? Cutting down. Cutting down. They were mowing the lawn. Now, if I happened to be at Daytona Beach eating at breakfast and looking across, seeing the lawn get mowed, what would it look like in Daytona Beach? Probably a guy on a mower, maybe just one guy in one mower, right? So how the lawn gets mowed is different in different places. The final product is the lawn getting mowed, but how it gets done is different in different places. Why is it done with three guys and three sickles in Mexico instead of one guy in one machine. Different resource base, right. So um, it's easy to say, oh, there's cheap Mexican labor. But I'm kind of trying to say, why is Mexican labor cheap, right? And so as we investigate that, it's due to the resource mix. There's more machines. The machine to person ratio in the United States is much higher than the machine to person ratio in Mexico. And so as those ratios changes, then labor can be, uh, the labor to machine mix can change, right? So the resource base is the right answer for that and that gets determined in the resource market. All right, and then who's going to get the stuff? Who gets the stuff in our market system in the United States? Who gets the goods? What do you have to have to get whatever you want at Walmart? Money. Now, where do you get your money from? The bank or work, right? So your ability to buy stuff is actually generated in the resource market on what you do. So you guys are here at Ottawa University, hopefully building up your pay that you would get with a degree versus not having a degree, right? And so you're building up your human capital is what we call it in economics class. You're putting some stuff up here, you're learning some skills, some different things to do for your comparative advantage, and now you will be able to command more resources 
when you have your new job after graduation compared to maybe what you could do otherwise without a degree. So that is the who part is determined in the resource market. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so there's the picture we had before with specialization. And now what we wanna to get to is the trade. So this is the market system. This is the way to conceptualize anyway the market system. It's actually missing a lot, but it tries to highlight us some fundamental, some fundamental things. So I've been talking a lot about Walmart. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of Walmart. Uh, they, they, they brought the lowest price. They've done the best for I, I care about poverty, and, and they've been one of the best uh, poverty smackers uh, that has gone on in the last uh, 40 years or whatever since their inception. It's been longer than that now. Um, so I'm not, uh, not one to pick on Walmart too much. Of course, they have their flaws. Everybody has their flaws too. But uh, So the Walmart stuff is going on here in what we call the goods market. So this is the output market or the market for final goods and services. So these guys are making things and these guys are buying those things, right? So we've got the green line is the spending that we do on goods and services. And this is that exchange. So ultimately, we're going to have a little supply and demand curve like we did uh, we did a little bit of that yesterday, but not much with bananas or something. And so that's what's going on in the final output market. The resources of society are owned by people over here. And those are sold to people who want to buy them, in large part these businesses, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. Now, some of you might say, oh, wait a second, I learned in business class that corporations can own stuff. We treat corporations like a person, and, and they can hold legal ownership of land and buildings and other things. And that's true, but who owns the corporation? What do we call the owners of a corporation? What is it? I heard somebody say it. Be brave. Tyler, was that you? No? What do we call corporation owners? Begins with an S. There's actually a couple words you could kick out. Owners of a corporation. Come on. I thought I heard somebody say it. Be brave. It's worth an extra credit point. Shareholders. shareholders. Boom. All right. I told you guys, remember, it's in the syllabus that I reserve the right to reward sometimes. Uh, give me your name again. Mason, last name? Odeker. With an S? Odeker? B. B. Mason B. Got it. All right, so Mason got it. A shareholder or a stockholder is the owner. And so that's a real person that owns those shares. So there might be thousands of owners of that corporation, but that's one of these people over here, right? So again, all of the resources in the economy are owned ultimately by people in different ways, shapes, and forms, but they're all owned by the people. And so that is the resource market, or we call them the factors of production, land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. Those are being sold, and what are they paying with? Wages, rents, interest, profits. So all of the payments for the resources are going to the households, and then they go to Walmart and they run through, right? And so we have this series of trades that go on day in and day out that we just take for granted. And this is what we start to learn in microeconomics, a little bit about how the world works and how all these exchanges work. Okay. Enter government. Dun, dun, dun. All right. So let's see. How does the government play into this? Um, in order for the government to function, they have to use some of those resources that would otherwise be going to private businesses to make stuff. So some of that gets derailed here to the government. And of course, they have to pay for that, those resources. So the little G here is representing the spending that the government does on those resources. The government also needs weapons of mass destruction. Right? Guns and ar arsenals and uh, toilet paper for Joe Biden's toilet at the White House. Where do they get that toilet paper? Probably Costco or Walmart or something, right? So, so some of the stuff, these final goods and services, end up going to the government and the government spends money on those weapons of mass destruction and toilet paper. 
And so the government enters the market system. Um, they typically don't build their own stuff. They usually are purchasing most of their stuff and utilizing either the resource market and or the goods market. How do they pay for that stuff? How do they pay for that stuff? Taxes. So in the resource market, when you guys spend $100 at Walmart, not all of that is going to Walmart. Some of it gets derailed here into the White House, right? So we call that the sales tax. Down here, your paycheck, if your employer owes you $1,000, of course, you don't get $1,000. You get like 900 or something, right? And so part of that money gets derailed up here to the White House, and that is our income tax. So you have your income after tax to choose how to spend it, but the government forces you to pay for some of what they do, whatever that stuff is. All right, so then we talked about weapons of mass destruction. We talked about paying somebody to clean the toilet at the White House. And then there's this G3. That's kind of the unique one. Uh, G3 is government spending, uh, the third type. And I like to call it Robin Hood spending. Robin Hood spending. What was the story of Robin Hood? Take from the rich, give to the poor, right? So it's what we call transfer payments or redistribution of, of money. And so it takes many forms though. It's not just take from the rich and give to the poor. It's also take from the healthy, give to the unhealthy. Take from the employed, give to the unemployed. This is the one that should hurt you more. Take from the young, give to the old. What do we call that one? Take from the young, give to the old. That's a system in the United States. Security. Social security system, right. So take from the old, take from the young, give to the old. There's not some big stock market account that we're paying all the old people their social security payments. It has always been a redistribution of from the young to the old. So when that money comes up, it's like whoop, it's like a revolving door. You guys pay your social security from your hard earned paycheck and they give it to some old person, right? So those sorts of transfer payments go on all the time. What fraction of your $100 that you paid the federal government, because you guys are at the age where you're probably starting to pay a little bit now, how much of it is Robin Hood versus weapons of mass destruction? So imagine that you've got a hundred dollars worth of tax. You know, what percentage of that tax is Robin Hood versus weapons of mass destruction? This includes roads, bridges, and you know, stuff like that too, internet, you know, whatever they spend their money on. But so this is like the goods and services, Robin Hood versus weapons of mass destruction and other spending. So I want you to come up with a number. I'm gonna come around and point around the room to all of you, so be ready with a number here. What I want you to say is, what fraction of this 100? Is it 3% is, it is Robin Hood and 97% is this? Is it 10% Robin Hood, 20%, 50%, 70%, 80%, 90%? Everybody ready? We're gonna do kind of a rapid fire. I'm gonna point at you, you gotta give me your number. So here we go, what percentage is transfer payments of Robin Hood type stuff. All right, here we go. Get your number ready. Go. 20, 30, 50, 40, 30, 20, 30, 25, 30, 45. Okay, I think the highest number I heard was 50 that we would be having the government do 50%. Most of you, if I was to average out, is somewhere probably 25 to 30, lots of 25s and 30s, right? So it turns out it's been 60 to 70%. 65% is roughly what it's running. It's actually been a little higher for COVID. So most of the government spending, this is usually a big eye opener, is Robin Hood stuff. The government thinks they know how to shuffle money around better than you know how to shuffle money around for yourself, right? So we have a kind of a forced payment so that the government chooses who gets. By the way, this includes like corporate welfare too, right? 
You guys heard of corporate welfare? Where they might get some subsidies, some free government money if they do things a certain way. Uh, some businesses might get some corporate welfare rather than just food stamps and other programs that might be trying to help the needy. So all kinds of spending like that. And uh, that is the number. Okay, so that's our system. I want to quickly do um, attendance today. And then we've got one more thing to wrap up on and we'll, we'll be ready to jump into it. So I'm going to say, um, let's see, I'm going to just go last name and just say here, Bank it? Here. Bell? Here. Blevins? Here. Bodeker? Here. Burns? Uh, let's see, let me do the little modification here. There we go. Okay. Uh, Carol? Kaler? Charles? Chloe? Did I hear it here? Okay. Nice and loud for me. Cooper? Curtis? Here? Nice and loud, please. Dom? D'Amato, Daniels, Here. Davis, Here. D'Amatio, Here. Dirks, Here. Evans, Here. Everett, Poindexter, Here. Franklin, uh, present. Frank, J, yeah, <laughs> what'd you say, present? <laughs> All right, uh, Grave, DePultra, Grease, right. Hendricks, Hoon, Johnson, Corey, Evan Johnson, Kemp, Kirkhoff, uh, Emily, <laughs> sorry I didn't want to even take a stab, I chickened out, Lang, Lang Noah, uh, that was you, okay, so Michael Paul's not here, okay, that's right, he was online last time, Masters, Meeks, Meekins, Murray, Moore, Obang, Ramsey, Riffle, Here. Rodriguez, Here. Sh Sorrentha, Here. Taylor, no Taylor, and Thomas, Jerice is a double absent. Okay. All right, so. Back to, I just wanted to make sure I left enough time. So here's the big plate of, uh, well, this isn't even the big plate of spaghetti. So we're just going to kind of round out things thinking about the world. We're going to talk about the world pretty quickly um, early on in this course, especially starting next week. But when we buy and sell, when we sell something to another country, what do we call that? Trade. Trade. It's, it, it is international trade. What's the thing if we sell or if you guys, maybe we should start with us buying something from China. What do we call that when we buy something from another country? Import, Import right? So we're importing something from a different country. We're purchasing it. What we sell to them is an export. So we got exports and imports. And so we have another country up here that has the same stuff going on with exchanges of their households. They have a certain size government. Up in China, which is, that's the outline of that country, by the way, their government might play a little bit bigger role, right? And they, they own more resources. So as we start to get into talking about socialism or something, the government is a lot bigger. The T is a lot bigger, and they own maybe the airlines, and they own the oil. If we look at Venezuela, which has been a disaster uh, the last uh, well, 15 years for sure, the last 10 have been awful. Um, they, they own all of the oil, right? So the more resource, what a socialist system means is that we let the government own more of the resource base. In a capitalist system, we let the people own the stuff, right? So the ownership of resources is pushed down to the lowest level, allowing people to choose what to do with that stuff. That's really at the heart of the difference between uh, socialist or communist type systems, the government has greater ownership and more control of things relative to what the people have. 
Okay, and so finally, the financial markets. Look at that plate of spaghetti. So we're gonna learn a little, little bits and pieces. This gets a little more ma macro-ish, but I wanted to bring in for micro, the decisions that we make, we don't all spend our money at Walmart on consumption, beer, chicken wings, t-shirts, pizzas, and cars and whatever. We save some of that money. So the financial markets are an important thing to look at. Another supply and demand. People who are saving their money ends up being somebody else borrowing that money. And the borrowers are typically these businesses that have a new idea of how they want to bring something new to the market. So they go to the financial markets and they borrow those funds. So over here, young people are typically not big savers, right? You guys are spending what you make. But as you start to get my age, I'm 50 now, uh, you start to save more and more because you have retirement coming and your savings starts to build and your spending patterns uh, change a little bit. And so the old people dominate the system over here and i say old in general savers dominate the spenders so even if you're not a saver in general households are savers so when we look at the supply of loanable funds it's coming from the households and corporations and other businesses they can save their money too but in general they are net borrowers. They're the demanders of funds to do stuff for their business, right? So we've got that going on in the financial markets. The other thing in the financial market is the Chinese. Does the government collect enough money to pay for Robin Hood and weapons of mass destruction? The US government. Every year, do we collect enough money to do the spending? Or do we have to borrow? No. Correct, no, we don't collect enough taxes, right? So the government is in the hole, which means that Joe Biden has to get out his pen and say, I owe you $10 billion. Joe Biden goes to the financial markets and says, hey, I need some money to pay for my Robin Hood and weapons of mass destruction. Uh, anybody want this piece of paper? I promise, I promise to pay you back, plus interest, and that's what he does. He issues this, the government borrows, and now this can be owned by anybody who is in the financial market. And China has been a big purchaser of that. And that'll be some of the fun stuff we'll pick up on, on Thursday. All right, Thursday night is your first homework, so make sure you get on MindTap. Make sure you click through Blackboard, remember. See you Thursday. Not a test, a homework. Yeah, on the mind tab. Yeah. So all online, not in class, but one of the homework. Yeah. And it's just to get, to get started to learn the system. Um, I doubt it. Did you get a physical book? Yeah. Okay. It's kind of Okay. So here's the problem. Um, the online system is what you need to do the homework and the test, and that has to be purchased. And you get your e-text with it for free. That's all part of the package. Okay. Now, if you want a physical book, then you can get it, but you're paying more than what you'd if you just got the package. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, your choice. You can choose to keep it or return it. I think Chegg has a pretty good return policy too, but otherwise, yeah, make sure you get okay. that system too. Thank you. So when I was on my tip last night, I was trying to figure out how do I turn in my assignment? Um, so you can, uh, oops, sorry, that's not a touch screen. Expand all that. Oh, expand all yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. So now, like, these are the first ones that are due Thursday. Mm -hmm. And so once you start the assignment, it's gonna automatically record it. So you'll you'll jump into an assignment, and then once you do the exercise, it'll automatically oh, record see. it. Yep. Perfect, thank you. Yep. Hey, um, when you, I don't know if you marked me a present for 